To formally get us going, I'd like to introduce M Megan Buick, who's going to give a short welcome and formally open the forum. Megan's the general manager of Comcare's Strategic Partnerships and Engagement Group, which includes Comcare's mental health and research team. So she's particularly invested and passionate about today's event. Megan is with us from Melbourne and joined by Greg Vines, Comcare's CEO. So welcome, Megan. I'll leave you to officially get us going and introduce our special guests. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, and um, welcome to everyone. I'm joining you today from the Rwundjeri of the Kulin Nation here in Melbourne, and I'm um, delighted to be here with Greg um, to, to kick off this forum and to have um, this first discussion, and I'll go on to introduce both Greg and our other special guest, Georgie Harmon, in a moment. Um, so National Safe Work Month is held annually during October and aims to raise awareness and enable discussion about safety at work. This initiative is driven by Safe Work Australia and is supported by work health and safety jurisdictions across the country, including, obviously, Comcare. This year, we have a series of activities during Safe Work Month, October, that are centred around weekly themes, and today is our first. The theme for this year's Safe Work Month is for everyone's safety work safely. This encourages us to prioritise safety in our workplaces and work towards reducing the number of work-related illnesses and, of course, fatalities. To that end, we've developed a do-it-yourself guide that provides a starting point to host your own safety activity or conversation with your colleagues. You'll be able to see that on your screen, but also it'll be shared in the chat if you wanted to have a look and download that. The guide steps through some considerations for planning conversations or to have um, your own activity, but also really how to have meaningful discussions about health and safety. And it's available, as I said, so it'll be um, through the chat. Comcare's forums and webinars aim to bring together a wide variety of people across the Comcare scheme to focus on aspects of work health and safety. These events are open to anyone in Comcare's jurisdiction, as well as those from other work health and safety um, areas. It's worth noting that the information, guidance and resources that we talk to specifically today are most relevant to the Comcare jurisdiction. So if you're uncertain about what's relevant to your own jurisdiction, you can contact your own uh, state and health and safety regulator if that's um, relevant. The format and topics for today's Psychosocial Health and Safety Forum have been developed by you, the audience. We really listen to and take on board what you tell us about what you'd like to see and hear from Comcare, and we put that into these sessions. This is our first event using um, a, this particular format, and we're really excited to see how it tests, and we really, really need your feedback to tell us what you think. Currently, we're planning to host two forums a year, uh, and as we said, we'd really like you to um, let us know what your thoughts are. It's also really important that we're able to align this event to coincide with World Mental Health Day. In particular, this forum, we plan to clarify for you some regulatory requirements around compliance, and we've got our colleagues Justin Napier and Luca Campbell joining us provide expert insights and psychosocial hazards, showcase better practice approaches, as well as um, a really fabulous panel discussion looking at um, learning from lived experience. For those of you that are attending this event for the first time, thank you for joining us. And for returning attendees, welcome back and thank you for participating. The first, um, the first foray of today's event is um, a really exciting opportunity to have a discussion between uh, Georgie Harmon and um, Greg Vines, so two really well-respected CEOs. And it's, it's, it's we call it a fireside chat, but there is no fire between us. <laughs> um, and we're looking at key challenges across the Australian mental health landscape, so really looking forward to that conversation. As I mentioned, the short Comcare regulatory and resource update presented by Justin Napier, General Manager of our regula regulatory operations group here at Comcare, and Luca Campbell, um, who's a director in Comcare's regula regulatory operations group as well. Further, we're delighted to um, welcome Carmen Schroeder from the Institute for Safety, Compensation and Recovery Research, who's presenting research on vicarious trauma, and it's a really important topic. 
And lastly, we're going to bring it together with a panel session, addressing some of the challenges, opportunities, and valuable insights gained from practical experiences in translating theory into practice. And for that, we've got Luca Campbell again, Connie Galati, who's joining us from the Australian Public Service Commission, and Carmen Schroeder um, from ISCA. There is an opportunity to post questions and comments throughout the forum, so please feel free to put them through in the chat. And as Andrew mentioned, we've received a lot of questions throughout the registration process. And what we've tried to do is to um, collate those and to um, use that as a starting point for the discussion this morning between um, Greg, Georgie and myself. And before we begin, um, I hope it's clear that we will be discussing multiple aspects of mental health throughout today's session. Just wanted to reiterate what Andrew has said, and if you need some supports, there has been some um, supports posted in the, in the chat if you would like to access those. That being said, we really hope today's session is enjoyable, informative, and provides you with valuable insights that you can take back to your workplaces. So, it is now with great pleasure that I welcome our first two speakers, Georgie Harmon and Greg Vines. So I'll just do a little brief introduction, a little bit about them. So Georgie Harmon is one of Australia's most influential and trusted figures in the mental health sector. She leads with a community heart and a business head. Since being first appointed CEO of Beyond Blue in 2014, Georgie has steered the organisation through significant growth and transformation, expanding services and supports, strengthening connection to the community and harnessing digital innovation. She's Deputy Chair of the Australian National Advisory Council on Alcohol and Other Drugs and serves on the boards of Mental Health Australia and mentoring organisation Kilfinan Australia. She's a patron of Out for Australia, an organisation that supports young LGBTIQA plus professionals. And before taking up the position at Beyond Blue, Georgie had broad ranging leadership experience in policy and service delivery in both the community, public and private sectors. Welcome, Georgie. We're delighted to have you join us today on this fabulous World Mental Health Day. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Greg Vines commenced at Comcare, as Comcare's Chief Executive Officer in April 2023. Prior to this, um, Greg was a Deputy General Deputy Director General, sorry, I always get that around the wrong way, for the International Labor Organization from 2012 to 2022, and was also um, a minister with the Australian Permanent Mission to the United Nations in Geneva from 2009 to 2012. Greg is well-respected leader and consensus builder, with decades of experience working with government, workers and employers in Australia, internationally and multilateral networks a highly experienced international public servant with expertise in diplomatic negotiations. Greg has a deep understanding of employment and labour relations, and Greg has led the implementation of an ambitious reform program that strengthened ILO governance arrangements and modernised systems. His leadership has established strong foundations from which to build an inclusive, sustainable and resilient future for work for all. A very warm welcome to you both. It's very exciting, um, and I'm very I'm very thrilled that um, Greg has taken up the position as CEO. So it's been a delight um, to have Greg as the CEO of Comcare, um, which has been um, fantastic. So I'll kick on because I'm conscious of time, and thank you for all the claps. Yeah. So the past few years have been a period of significant challenge and change. So what I'd like to start with is asking our speakers to tell us about some of the current and emerging issues across Australia's mental health landscape, just to get us started on a small note. So Georgie, can we please ask you uh, to give us your insights into this first question, please? Hello, everyone. Thanks for that very warm welcome, Megan. Um, and sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, so I'm going to zoom out because I think um, what's going on in, in the world is, is really fundamental to what's happening at an individual level, at a workplace level, at a community level. So, and and as human beings, you know, we're not just one dimensional. We, we, the things that really drive how we feel, our well-being, um, are very loosely described. I often talk about, you know, um, somewhere safe to live, something meaningful to do, and a date on a Saturday night. So, it's the things that actually 
you know, are we, do we feel safe and respected at work in our communities? Um, do we live in, in secure housing? Um, have we, can, we, can we afford to put good food on the table? Can we pay the rent, the mortgage? Um, are we getting enough sleep? Uh, do we have good access to healthcare, including mental health care? And most importantly, do we feel connected? And I think that's something that we're all, you know, has really been uh, driven home in the last few years. Do we have a sense of purpose? Do we feel connected? Um, and I think to understand your employees right now, um, it's important to really understand the global trends that are really shaping the world and our experiences of that world. So the CSIRO have talked about a number of mega trends that um, have uh, will have a transformative impact on life and how we live it over the next 20 years or so. And they include um, a change in climate, more extreme weather events. We're already seeing that happening, unfortunately, uh, this year. Um, the growing health burden and increasing chronic diseases. Um, geopolitical shifts. We're all watching uh, with, I think, you know, horror what's unfolding on our televisions in Gaza and um, at the moment, Ukraine, rising tensions in, in the Asia Pacific. Um, and then a boom in digitization, um, remote working, telehealth, the, the growing threat of cybersecurity, and also the influence of social media. Um, and then finally, the explosion of artificial intelligence and more automated working ways of working. And as people are grappling with that maelstrom of economic, social and in, uh, environmental, I think anxiety actually in many cases, they're becoming more fearful and they're losing trust in institutions and traditional sources of authority. And we know that from global trust barometers, such as the one that's been run for many years by Edelman. And that lack of control and that lack of faith in leadership can actually be profoundly unsettling um, and have an effect on our emotional well-being, especially in volatile times. Uh, and we're certainly living through volatile times. And at the same time, leaders in workplaces are questioning productivity. Um, trending topics like the great resignation, like quiet quitting, um, are also adding to that narrative of distrust. So I think there's a fundamental renegotiation going on um, in terms of people's view and experience and feeling about work. And all of those things have implications for our mental health. And they are absolutely compounded by the pressures that people are feeling right now. The cost of living crisis is obviously just one. Um, we know that the mental health challenges and financial stress are two sides of the same coin. We've just done some recent research with ASIC on this. Um, and uh, a few days ago, the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, released the national study on mental health and wellbeing. Um, and that's a study of six that was engaged 16,000 people across Australia. Um, and it's the biggest study of its kind in Australia. And it, the last one was 16 years ago. So this is the latest data. And what that is showing us is that at a population level, prevalence of mental health conditions actually hasn't changed much since 2007. About 4.3 million um, Australians experience a mental health issue in the past 12 months. Um, and that's about one in five of us in any given year. Um, and But nearly half of us uh, will experience some kind of mental health challenge in our lifetime. So that really hasn't shifted over the last 16 years. But what has shifted is a couple of really important things. Um, help seeking has increased. That's a good thing. Um, up to 45% from 35% in 2007. But the most concerning thing is, whilst at a population level, mental health um, conditions and prevalence haven't really shifted, uh, particular groups are experiencing significantly higher rates of mental ill health, in particular young people um, and other, um, uh, I guess, more marginalised groups like LGBTIQ plus uh, communities. 39% um, of young people aged 16 to 24 were found to have experienced a mental health condition in the last year, and that was only 26% in 2007. So that's really quite profound and, and worrying. Um, also, the ABS last month released the latest suicide data, um, and it's shown a slight increase um, in the suicide rate um, compared to 2021. 
Um, and, you know, um, while suicide is complex, that that's, you know, this every suicide affects, you know, so many people. Um, and I think what all that points to is the fact that we have got a mental health system that's actually was actually designed and built decades ago um, and that actually needs profound structural change. Um, we are um, increasingly digital natives, um, increasingly younger generations are accessing healthcare and mental health care in different ways. Um, and I, I'm, I say often we are never going to have enough psychiatrists and psychologists in Australia. And in fact, not everybody needs that level of specialist care. So we've got to get more creative about not just workforces, but also structures, how people access services you know, what is the continuum of care? How do we actually meet people where they are and not, at the moment we've got a very provider-led system. So how do we actually build a system around people and their contemporary needs? Um, so, so look, those are some, of those, it's pretty bleak, isn't it? But, um, you know, I'm, I'm really hopeful that um, we are on the journey towards structural change, but right now um, people are doing it really tough. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you for those, um, those insights. Um, Greg, did you have anything to add or to contribute to the discussion? Oh, well, thanks, Megan. Thanks very much for the opportunity this morning. And, and thanks to you too, Georgie, for uh, supporting uh, Comcare in this in this uh, forum today. Uh, look, I think Georgie has really summed it up well. And certainly um, from my experience, particularly my previous role working uh, uh, internationally on workplace issues in particular, there is no question that um, mental health issues uh, are ripe in Australia, but they, they're ripe so far all around the world and uh, for different reasons in, in different countries, I think, but certainly some of the factors that Georgie referred to are, are common everywhere. I think um, a lot of this has been exacerbated by COVID, uh, the, the impact that that had on individuals and um, also the impact it's had on the whole relationship between uh, work and personal life as well. It's much more blurred now than I think it was before because people were working from home or working in non-traditional workplaces, if you like, for, for year after year. And it's really changed a lot of that um, uh, that whole feeling of being at work. So COVID is, is almost something that threads through all of those other factors. And I think it will take us some time to, uh, to really overcome that and, and get through um, the implications of COVID. But certainly the other issues, conflict around the world um, is one that uh, um, creates enormous stress, not just for those people who are who are confronted with it day in day out, but uh, for their for their families, for their um, contacts living in other parts of the world as well. And I think related to that is um, that drop in trust in institutions that we've seen over the last few years. That really gets people wondering about you know what does the future hold? What what is What's going to life going to be like for our children, for our grandchildren? And these uh, these do create enormous um, stresses for people. Climate is also another um, major impact, I think, climate change and the impact that that's going to have uh, on communities, on jobs, on livelihoods, uh, on opportunities for people all around the world. And I think the um, other issue that, that plays through this, um, through this all, is the impact of social media in um, bringing, well, on the, in a positive sense, bringing much more information out to people generally, but in a negative sense, all of the mistruths, all of the, um, the fear mongering and other issues that you do see on social on social media. But I am confident, and I share the, a bit of the optimism that, that Georgie has expressed as well. Um, our awareness of mental health issues, and from my experience, mental health issues in the workplace, awareness has increased phenomenally over the last few years. People are now taking it much more seriously uh, than what was previously the case. We are seeing, I think, some, some good progress being made in destigmatising mental health issues, and employers are starting to recognise that that what happens outside of the workplace can have a massive impact in the workplace as well. And so employers are seeing the, the benefits from retention, from productivity, in ensuring that workplaces are safe, uh, that they're respectful, that they provide dignity to people. Um, that's the way uh, you know work and society comes together to help overcome these sort of issues. 
So there are massive, massive challenges out there, but I think there are opportunities. I think organisations like Beyond Blue, like Comcare, like um, other uh, workplace health and safety organisations have an obligation to really be on the front foot, to inform, to educate, to support um, workers, members of the community, employers, governments in really working together to tackle this problem. Because unless we are on the front foot, unless we are tackling this in a positive way, it will consume so much of, of what all of our thinking is on a day-to-day -day basis. It's an excellent um, segue, Greg, into our next um, question and something that we've received from the audiences as well. But, Georgie, can I just ask you to continue um, this theme and discussion around how this current environment in which um, we've just described, um, how does that relate to work and workplaces? Mm. Well, look, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time at work, right? And um, work is good. Work is good for us. It's good for our mental health. You know, we it, it gives us a sense of purpose, a sense that we're contributing. Um, it not just pays the bills. Uh, it, it actually, you know, you know, for many people, it's it's really part of their DNA and and it's, you know, good work is good for us. So, um, and workplaces, because we do spend a lot of time there and it's, you know, they are micro communities, I think, um, they're, they're a really great opportunity for prevention and early intervention in particular. Um, and also, uh, you know, a really good way to increase the participation of people who live with mental health conditions. Um, you know, we know that in particular people with severe and enduring mental health conditions are locked out of good work a lot of the time. So I think there are massive opportunities there for workplaces to really role model what good could look like. Um, uh, and conversely, you know, workplaces can cause great harm to our well-being and our mental health. Um, and I think the one thing that we've, we're all, regardless of the industry that you work in, um, we've all got workforces under immense stress at the moment um, after a period of enormous disruption. And, you know, as, we, as Greg and I talked about um, in the first question, you know, we're all grappling with new challenges. Um, and, you know, we can't separate, you know, they're, they're, there's the interconnectivity of these things um, are real. People don't exist only at work or only at home. Um, so we need to think about, uh, I think, the different aspects of, of our employees' lives and come up with blueprints for mentally healthy workplaces that perhaps look different um, to the ones that we had five years ago or even three years ago. Um, our friends at the Black Dog Institute have uh, recently released some research on this topic. It's called Modern Work. And they found that digitisation in particular has blurred the lines between work and home. Um, creating an always on culture. And then you combine that with the fact that jobs are actually more complex these days um, than they were a decade ago. There's increasing anxiety about fu the future, um, the march of AI, um, the gig economy, et cetera, et cetera, job insecurity. So um, with all of these things in particular, having a greater impact on younger workers, uh, that's why I think we absolutely need to go back to basics in some degree and look at how we're actually designing our workplace mental health strategies, um, making sure that people have access to support and that we're building safe communities at work where people um, have confidence of putting their hand up and saying, actually, I'm not doing too well, I'm struggling a bit. Um, at the earliest possible stage so that the workplace can actually be part of the solution to helping them to get back on track. Um, and I think uh, part of that, you know, we are, we are, I, I have as a CEO, and, and I'm sure many of you online will be observing this in your workplaces, we've got a more diverse and more multi-generational workforce than we've ever had. And that means that monolithic um, you know, workplace mental health strategies just won't cut it anymore. But each generation is experiencing these issues quite differently and having um, reactions to to things, um, you know, so the one size fits all really doesn't work anymore. Um, so I think, you know, we've got to go back to basics to some degree. We cannot have monolithic approaches. We've got to really sit and listen to our our people and say, what is going to make the difference to you and be nuanced about that. 
um, <clears throat> and and move away from just you know the annual staff engagement survey every year to actual constant listening. You know what's the, what's the dialogue that we're having that's two way. Um, so that we really understand uh, people's expectations of us as employers, but also we're really clear about our expectations of them as as um, as the employer. So there's just some some um, and look, you know, the 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 um, labour force is, you know, the unemployment rates the lowest it's been since the 1970s. So we know that the number one issue facing many employers is workforce, uh, workforce ret retention and attraction, and we know that. Uh, the latest data I saw was that 41% of uh, people um, are considering, they're likely to consider leaving their current employer in the next six to 12 months. 41%. Um, that's a YouGov um, uh, research issue, um, from May this year. So these are some of the, again, the real issues that we are grappling with, we're all grappling with. Um, and uh, and I think we we need to you know, really understand what's going on for our employees, be much more nuanced about the design of our strategies um, and not have a one size fits all. Mm. Thanks, Georgie. And I'm just noting that there's a lot of great conversation happening in the chat and it looks like everyone's helping each other to solve their own, um, the problems and questions that come up. So thank you for that. And again, we really use this information that's coming through uh, to help drive some supports and things that um, Comcare may be able to help you with. I'll just um, change tack slightly. Uh, I'm going to ask Greg now around um, how does uh, what we're talking about, so the mental health impacts, the mental health environment, um, how does that relate to the Work Health and Safety Act? Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's a good question. And it's again, it comes back to this, I think a large part of it comes back to this understanding and awareness. Um, for the duration of our legislation, the Work Health and Safety Act, and the same in in most jurisdictions in Australia that are part of the um, harmonised system, um, mental health has, has always been included and, and included alongside uh, physical injuries that, that we see, but that's not being well understood, not being well understood or appreciated at all. And I think this goes back <clears throat> as well to a lack of understanding of, the, of many of the issues around mental health, this, um, issues around stigma of mental health and so on. Um, but what has recently changed as, as a result of a review that was done, I think, in 2018, is that much more prominence is now being given to mental health um, illnesses and injuries in the uh, in our legislation and, and progressively uh, across Australia as well. So that rather than it just being lumped in, it's now highlighted to a much greater extent. Work is being done on finalising a code of practice um, around mental health, and I think the uh, sort of work that Comcare and other WHS uh, organisations do in promoting awareness is also uh, starting to have a, an impact. Um, there's work being done on, on notification of mental health uh, issues within the workplace as well. So the legislation um, has always covered it, but it's been a silent partner, if you like. And so now uh, it's being given far more, far more prominence, which which is absolutely timely. As Georgie has, has indicated, you know, with statistics that came out of that um, uh, report just a week or so ago, the, the um, um, prominence of mental health in the workplace is becoming a much, much greater issue. And so we need to ensure that not only are the, the practices and policies in place, but underpinned by a very solid legislative base as well. And that's now what we are uh, starting to see, thankfully, uh, in Australia. But I think just to follow up on some of the comments that Georgie made as well about um, the workplace issues, there is a massive, and I indicated this before, now blurring between personal lives and work lives. You know, the working from home idea or, or working in alternative workspaces certainly is a great benefit for the mental health of many workers, but it is also a double-edged sword. It leads to isolation. It leads to, to often a feeling of exclusion. It leads to um, not being part of the social interaction mm -hmm. that comes from work. And I get particularly concerned uh, for younger workers, particularly those that went through COVID, missed out on that socialisation mm -hmm. in that last couple of years of school in their transition from being kids to adults. They now go into workplaces where the social interaction in a workplace um, which I think is an important part of, of moving into adulthood, uh, just isn't present mm. in so many cases. And so 
you know, we've got to be very cautious around some of these new practices that are coming into the workplace and making sure we're getting that um, getting that appropriate balance. There's also, of course, an issue on working from home where sometimes there is a lot of pressure on workers to work from home. There, it might be family conflict, it might be an expectation related to child, child care or elder care that in, in turn puts further pressure on people. And so our programs, the legislative basis, the approach that we take needs to be looking at all of these issues. And then there are also the other sorts of policies and, and programs that employers, I think, need to be making sure they're um, putting in place around inclusion, around in, uh, in not just um, uh, recognising diversity in workplaces and what it can bring, but embracing diversity in workplaces, be it cultural diversity, gender diversity, whatever. But we've really got to look at this in a very holistic way. As I say, underpinned by legislation, supported by policies and practices, but most importantly, really a strong commitment between employers, between unions, between workers themselves in really trying to move this forward. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, and I just note that um, our colleagues, Luca and Justin, will talk a little bit more about um, exactly um, the, impl the implications of the new regulations that came through around the Work Health and Safety Act. So that's a bit further on in the session, but that's a really great entree. So thank you. Um, thank you, Greg. So I guess, Georgie, what um, the next sort of frame I'd like to talk about is what advice or what information or what um, insights, again, do you have around um, employers working in this as you said earlier, this maelstrom of um, of an environment in which we uh, we find our working selves. Oh, you're just on mute, Georgie. <laughs> you didn't hear my existential crisis then. Um, so <laughs> we it, it's, it. <laughs> it's it's such a it's such a simple but complex thing, right? And I, and I I I think we we have a tendency to really overcomplicate this stuff. What do we want as people? We want to actually be seen, heard, to feel like we're doing work with purpose, um, to be able to contribute to the design of our work, to, to see that our work contributes to the purpose of the organisation and it's having an impact on our customers or clients. Um, so to me, and that, you know, that is at its core is what this is about. It's about people coming together in a workplace, um, understanding their role and working together to achieve good things. Now, that sounds very Pollyanna-ish, but I think, you know, we're very good at designing systems and processes and things like that. And sometimes I think what we forget as employers, and especially as we move up, you know, the hierarchy and we get fancy titles like CEO, is to actually just sit with people and say, how does it feel to work here? Um, you know, is it clear? Is your job clear? Have we designed your job well? Is, are you are your workloads manageable? What would make a difference to you on a day-to-day -day basis? What do you think some of the solutions are? So, again, I think this – and there was some great conversation in the chat earlier um, around – communication, the importance of communication um, and, and having that dialogue. It's not just top-down communication. It's actually about dialogue. So I think we've all got to get better as leaders of just going back to those basic tenets of just listening and talking and sitting and reflecting. Um, and that stuff is cheap. It doesn't cost a thing, right? It just costs our time. Um, and I tell you what, when people feel heard, they'll, they'll thrive. <laughs> And they'll certainly feel, even if you don't, if you if you can't implement the solutions that they've come up with, um, quite often they'll, you know, the, the feeling of being heard is sometimes enough, right? So that's my Pollyanna answer. Um, I think, but I think when we get down to basics, when we do this stuff well, um, we have, and one of the things that I'm saying to boards, at the uh, people who employ CEOs at the moment is, you know, we all, as CEOs, we need to be able to read a balance sheet. We need to be able to be good at stakeholder management and relationships. We need to understand the complexities of the organisations that we run. But are we compassionate? You know, are you, so I'm saying to people who employ leaders, you know, 
what are the softer skills, the emotional intelligence that we should be prioritising over some of these other more traditional characteristics when we recruit leaders? Um, because compassionate leadership is strong leadership. It's effective leadership. Um, and it's and it's what people are looking for these days. They want they want people who actually get them and and hear them and see them and, and appreciate that well, their lives are complex. Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, what are we measuring? What are we measuring? If we're just measuring, um, uh, you know, the numbers of psychological claims or, uh, you know, access to EAPs or anything like that, we're actually looking in the back, in the rearview mirror. So um, what we should be doing, I think, is really designing metrics and KPIs and measurement strategies that actually are measuring what are the aspects of your business or your organisation that are having a really positive impact on your workers and what are having a negative impact. Um, and there's really great simple tools like People at Work, <clears throat> um, which, which, you know, can actually really help you to do that simple diagnostic. Um, do employees actually believe that mental health, their mental health and wellbeing is taken seriously and prioritised by the business? Um, do your managers and leaders actually feel equipped and confident to play their part in having proactive conversations or supporting their people? Um, and, and I think this is the most important one. It's, this is the ultimate barometer. This is the canary in the coal mine. Do employees feel comfortable putting up their hand and asking for support when they need it or flexibility? Um, this will give you really strong insights into stigma and connectedness in the workplace. And then lastly, are your mental health programs and services and supports actually making a difference? It, again, it's not just about throughput or access issues. Are people feeling better as a result? Is their distress reducing? Um, do they feel they're functioning better? So the data that you collect actually will drive the action that you're taking. And, and I know that this stuff can be complex, but if, if we just adopt measures that feel like window dressing, we often leave the bigger, more urgent issues unaddressed and your people will see that. Um, it, so this stuff's challenging because it often shows them through the mirror, you know, that things aren't going as well as you'd like. But um, if we tackle this just from an inputs or activity perspective, um, and also just taking a risk-based lens to this. It, it's often counterproductive because you're just managing risk rather than managing to thrive. Um, so, you know, those are some of the some of the things that, you know, I think we're all grappling with at the moment as leaders. Thanks, Georgie. And again, thanks for the chat because there's some really good um, conversation happening there and um, questions and suggestions also around uh, linking people with resources um, and other tools and support. So thanks, Georgie. Greg, did you have any other advice for employers in terms of sort of this current environment and where we find ourselves? Yeah, absolutely. And I 100% uh, agree that the, the answer is prevention, not cure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, employers in particular, I think, have really got to be quite assertive in, uh, and serious in their preventative problems. We see, you know, virtually all organisations will have fantastic policies, fantastic mm -hmm. manuals, great things sitting on the shelf. But the difference is the way that is led. And I, and I agree with George's comments that a, a particular a key role for leaders these days, for chief executives of organisations, is to be leading on this issue, not just to be handing it off to the HR department or the EAP or somewhere else, but for them to be demonstrating this in the way that they work, in the way that they uh, communicate, in the way that they lead. Um, certainly, uh, in the six months that I've been in this role, I've had the great opportunity about um, meeting with heads of, of uh, the various organisations that come within our jurisdiction, and I've been very impressed with um, uh, with some of them who have a regular discussion at their executive committees mm. on mental health in the workforce, you know, what are the actions that can be taken. Concerning, though, is that a number of them also say that whilst they get good interaction at that uh, most senior levels in organisations, at least from a discussion point of view, how it then permeates down the organisation mm. to supervise the levels, how well equipped, how well aware are people at the supervisory mm. level to deal, to identify and deal or appropriately refer uh, these sorts of issues. So it really is, I don't like the same, but it really is that that walking the talk on this. You can't just have, have the policies and practices, you've actually got to be 
demonstrating them day in, day out. And I think the issues around, you know, dignity at work, inclusiveness at work, uh, people being able to feel that they can speak up, that they can contribute, that they can um, express alternative views without uh, suffering detriment without being bullied, without you know being ostracised, I think is a is a key important part of this. I would also say though it is incredibly important to recognise um, the different natures of workplaces. There's not one size fits all for this. You know, we are just doing some work now about particular um, mental health challenges for workers in uh, remote and isolated locations. You know there are a completely different set of factors that can affect those workers to what affect those of us who work in Melbourne or Sydney or, in, or Canberra. And, you know, similarly with small organisations that don't have the resources themselves to deal with a lot of these issues. So we've got to make sure that we're, we're tailoring um, programs, we're tailoring support, we're tailoring advice to match up with those very different circumstances. But the other key message here, I think, to employers, and most of them, not all of them, but most of them recognise the benefit to them in ensuring they've got mentally um, healthy, safe, uh, mentally mentally healthy and safe workplaces, it it um, it overcomes the issues yeah. around retention. It overcomes the issues around motivation. Mm -hmm. It provides that safe, secure environment where workers want to thrive, where they want to contribute, where they want to be more productive. Um, so it's a it's almost a no brainer. But we've got to get us still a long way before it becomes completely embedded into organisations. Thank, thanks, Greg. And um, we're we're getting through the timing, which is amazing. And I knew this would happen. So, um, which is yeah, lovely. And thanks again for the um, for the conversation in in the chat. Um, Georgie, one of the questions we've also had put to us from the audience is. Um, obviously, it's not obviously, but unfortunately, uh, it's not possible to prevent all mental health related um, issues, particularly in, in the workplace as they arise. Is there some things that you can um, share with us around how you can support workers, uh, including um, supervisors and managers, when things aren't going well or things are going a little bit um, off, off script, if you like, in the workplace? Yeah, look, um, I think, it, again, it comes down to those early conversations. Um, you know, if we, jo if we design jobs well, if we are clear in the objectives and purpose of the organisation, if people can see the fit of their roles and have got work plans that actually help them see the link between strategy and their individual contribution, um, not everything goes to plan, right? People have... Um, the whole 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 series of both professional and personal things often get in the way of us being, you know, performing at our best at work. I've certainly experienced that at various times in my career. Um, and I think that the thing that I see that needs to happen more and that doesn't happen enough is those early conversations, um, both from the perspective. And we can't expect people, you know, the, the worker themselves who's experiencing a challenge, um, to to lean in and put their hand up you know we we often talk about that and that's an important thing but we've also got to lean in um and we've got to lean in as as people leaders um where ideally you've got a team that you actually have a relationship with um you don't need to be best friends but you actually you know i think when you understand people and you know what that makes them tick when you understand a little bit of their challenges um whether that's you know health challenge or a um a cognitive challenge or a you know family challenge you often can negotiate and and you know design work better for everybody um, but what i don't see happen often enough is when the wheels do start to wobble those early conversations you know the leaning in how how are you going i'm just a little bit worried about you i've noticed you're not as you know you're withdrawing a bit when, when we're in team meetings or you're missing deadlines and you don't normally do that or you know, your communication to me has changed. What, you know, is there something going on? Is there something I can help you with? Um, you know, um, don't want to breach any, you know, confidentiality or, you know, you can tell me what you want to, but I just want you to know that I've noticed. And and quite often people will respond well to that and they will feel seen and heard and go, well, actually, no, I'm having a pretty crappy time. Um, and then it becomes a dialogue about solving the problem together. Um that's the thing that I think will really shift things. But what generally happens is that 
people become more and more and more disconnected. The people leader sees and gets more and more agitated about deadlines being missed and work, you know, what that's going to, how that's going to reflect on them. And quite often the manager is the meat in the sandwich. Mm-hmm. Um, and the worker themselves is, is you know, is getting more and more stressed about the fact that they know they're not thriving, they know they're not kicking goals. And it becomes really vexation, not not vexatious, it becomes confrontational. It becomes mm-hmm. about people retreating to their corners and and getting their you know, getting their legal advices out when, in fact, a really human conversation early on often solves this because you start to understand one another's perspective. Um, so I think you know, that is the biggest thing I think we need to do. And in order to do that, we've got to equip our managers and we've got to empower our managers and we've got to give permission to our managers to have those conversations confidently, safely. Mm-hmm. Um, for both the person and themselves, um, uh, because you know when we connect, we all do better. I mean that's a you know truism. Um, so I think you know that the 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 equipping of that senior leader, uh, the people the sort of middle manager level is is probably one of the most important things we can do alongside you know good job design and clarity of contribution um, and you know keeping an eye on things like excessive continuous continually excessive workloads I mean we all have peaks and troughs in terms of you know stress at work and stress actually sometimes helps us perform better Um, but when it's persistent and enduring it gets really unhealthy so those are some of the other things I think really just you know we've got to start thinking more creatively about different types of supports for people so, you know, we've been working with Comcare over the last few years with our early intervention coaching service, which is um, is an earlier intervention support option for people than waiting to the point that they need sort of specialist psych- psychological uh, professional care. And we're seeing fantastic results in terms of prevention and recovery. You know, about 72 percent, I think, of people who enter new access um, in the workplace actually quite unwell actually um and then we measure their improvement through coaching over six sessions and by the time they exit the program they're clinically recovered and they've got a whole bunch of skills and and uh and strategies that actually help them deal with stressors in the future so you know i think these new models of care and workplaces are also really important yeah thanks georgie and there's a great chat happening too um Particularly, I think picked up on the point around supervisors and managers and the tools and, and um, the tools that uh, they're required to have to be, enable those conversations, as you've just talked about, to really happen and to lean in and to understand them. I think for me, one of the truisms is around knowing your team and really understanding that so that you can pick up relatively quickly when things are perhaps um, not as they were and that you can have some of those really lovely conversation starters that you talked to, Georgie. So thank you for that. Greg, I don't know if you had anything else to contribute or add on the back of what um, Georgie just said around, um, I guess, when things are not going well in organisations, um, what you see, certainly from a WHS perspective. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it re- the, the tone's got to come from the top on this. Mm-hmm. But as I said before, and as Georgie has just indicated, it is that middle level manager that I think is a critical part of all of this. And quite often, those people themselves don't feel equipped to deal with uh, the challenges that they're facing in the workplace. And it can be one of the most difficult parts of, of being a manager. Um, so we've got to ensure that, you know, the various management development programs, supervisor development programs, the, the training of our, of our middle level people um, incorporate uh, mental health awareness issues into it. If they don't feel personally equipped to deal with issues, they at least need to know where to, to refer it to or where to get assistance from. In this, and I think that um, you know, in our jurisdiction across the public sector, we see a lot of uh, training focused on hugely valuable issues, but you don't often see it focused on mental health awareness. You don't see position descriptions or selection criteria based on people's capacity to deal with mental health issues. And so, this is where you know, earlier when I mentioned we've got to embed these sort of practices into day-to-day work life, into day-to-day uh, management. But I think it's, it's an issue that, um, uh, you know, the resources are out there. We've seen on the chat a number of, of different organisations promoting their resources, and I encourage all of you to do that. The more sharing of this information we can get, 
the better off it is. But we've really got to be pushing that out. Mm. We've really got to be getting that built in to organisations, own training development programs, own awareness programs, and ensuring that managers themselves feel supported, uh, feel resourced to be able to go in and address uh, these issues, the early chats, the um, the arm on the shoulder, the flexibility in working arrangements, that they don't need to go through big, long processes to give somebody some space. Mm-hmm. We've got to be able yeah. to ensure that they're enabled, that they're empowered, um, and able to respond uh, effectively and immediately with, uh, with a lot of these challenges. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Georgie. Um, we've actually come to time, which um, went very quickly. So um, that was that was a really fabulous discussion. Um, I would like to extend my thanks so much to Georgie and Greg for having um, this conversation. I, the collective wisdom, the small uh, the small opportunities for us to um, really engage on some of those practical, simple solutions, I think is incredibly valuable from two leaders that have got a vast amount of experience. So um, thank you, and thank you so much for sharing sharing that with us today. It's been um, it's been terrific, and I think certainly um, the audience, just based on the interaction, I can see have really um, got a lot out of it. So really appreciate it. Um, and thank you. So um, we're now continuing with the forum. So we've got um, we've still got some other presenters that are going to be working with us today. But um, uh, I'll let you say goodbye, Georgie. If that's yeah. Goodbye, Georgie. <laughs> Thanks, Georgie. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, take, take care. care. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you. And I'll hand back over to um, to Andrew, who's going to um, introduce our next session. So thank you. Thanks, Megan, um, Georgie and Greg. Um, there was a, certainly a lot of conversation and discussion going on in the chat and some really engaged participants with their own insights and reflections and questions uh, that were being shared. <clears throat> so for our next session, we'll be hearing from Justin Napier, who's General Manager of Comcare's Regulatory Operations Group, and Luca Campbell, who's Director of Comcare's National Regulatory Programs. And they'll be giving an update on Comcare's regulatory environment and approach to psychosocial regulation, as well as highlighting some of the latest tools and resources Comcare has available, which I know a number of you were asking about uh, through the chat. So I'll now welcome uh, Justin and Luke, over to you. Thanks, Andrew, and good morning to you all. Um, thanks for joining us today for this psychosocial safety forum on World Mental Health Day, and thanks to Georgie and Greg for your insights and the passion that you bring to the work that we do in this space. So great to see so many people here who are interested in the prevention of work-related psychological harm and engaging in these important discussions about psychosocial safety in workplaces. So as Andrew said, Justin Napier is my name, General Manager Regulatory Operations Group, and with me is Luca Campbell, our Director of National Regulatory Programs. So what we'll do in this session is provide you with an update on Comcare's approach to regulating psychosocial hazards within our jurisdiction. And we'll also sh- uh, share some information about what you can do to promote mental health in your workplaces. But let's begin with a quick overview of Comcare, just to explain who we are and what we do to make workplaces safer. So Comcare has two high-level functions. We are the regulator under the Commonwealth Work Health Safety Act, and we're also the Workers' Compensation Authority under the Commonwealth uh, Safety Rehabilitation and Compensation Act. The Work Health Safety Act aims to protect workers against harm to their health, safety and welfare through the elimination or minimisation of risks arising from work. And the Workplace Rehabilitation Provisions of the SRC Act aim to maximise an injured worker's chances of an early and safe return to work. So our jurisdiction under these two statutory functions does overlap, but not completely, as you can see on the slide there. However, Comcare's general purpose, which unifies both our WHS and workers' compensation roles, is to promote and enable a safe and healthy work. Now, some people here today may uh, not be from our jurisdiction. You are, of course, welcome to listen to this uh, presentation and join the discussion on Comcare's approach to regulation of psychosocial hazards at work. But do check whether with your state or territory regulator as necessary to see if there's any particular requirements under those legislations. 
So let's now turn to psychosocial regulation. The Work Health Safety Act defines health as both physical and psychological health. So this means that risks to psychological health arising from work have always been within the remit of the Work Health Safety Act. To provide clarity and consistency in the management of psychosocial risks, the Work Health Safety Regulations were recently amended. They now include a definition of the term psycho psychosocial hazard and explain how a PCBU, an employer, must manage risks to health and safety arising from those hazards. According to the WHS regulations, a psychosocial hazard may oh, sorry, a psychosocial hazard may cause psychological harm, whether or not it may it also causes physical harm. Now these hazards can arise from or relate to the design or management of work, the work environment, plant at a workplace, or workplace interactions or behaviours. And in 2022, Safe Work Australia released its model code of practice for managing psychosocial hazards at work. This document provides helpful information on identifying psychosocial hazards and includes guidance on what reasonably practicable risk management looks like. In particular, the code of practice identifies 14 known psychosocial hazards that may arise in the workplace. So I encourage you, if you have not already done so, to consult the Safe Work Australia model code of practice and consider whether these psychosocial hazards are present in your workplace. It's worth noting, though, a Commonwealth code of practice is yet to be approved by the Commonwealth Minister, but we expect this to be available in the near future. In the interim, we are advising duty holders to refer to the Safe Work Australia model code of practice. I'll now hand over to Luca, who will tell us a bit more about Comcare's approach to regulating psychosocial hazards. Thanks very much, Justin, and good morning, everybody. So Comcare's approach to psychosocial regulation is guided by our compliance and enforcement policy. Um, which is available on our website, and I've included a link on this slide here, which will be um, distributed with uh, around after today's presentation. When it comes to the practical things we do to promote and enable safe and healthy work, our work spans across a spectrum of proactive and reactive activities. On the proactive side, we offer a range of services to provide information and advice to the jurisdiction on how to make workplaces safer. This includes the Work Health and Safety Help Desk, education products and e-learns, presentations and regularly updated guidance material. We also do proactive inspections to engage our jurisdiction and provide information and advice even in the absence of a work health and safety complaint or concern. In the middle of the spectrum, we have our monitoring compliance activities which include responding to work health and safety concerns and incident notifications. And as we move across towards the reactive side of the spectrum, we use the enforcement tools more readily within our enforcement toolkit. These might include conducting investigations, issuing enforcement notices and commencing prosecutions. We of course use these tools very carefully and proportionately having regard to the best way we can ensure duty holders are compliant with their legal obligations under the work health and safety regime. You might notice that although our work does expand the entire spectrum, a large range of our services are designed to achieve compliance proactively, um, meaning that they're more targeted at the proactive side of the spectrum. This is consistent with our regulatory principle of enabling our jurisdiction to take responsibility for its own compliance as set out in our compliance and enforcement policy. One of the specific um, functions that we were wanting to briefly mention today was the psychosocial regulation team. This team was set up to assist with the regulation of psychosocial hazards, um, including the proactive psychosocial inspection program, which I'll be talking about shortly. The Specialist Inspectorate has regulatory and mental health experience and helps Comcare achieve its objectives through regulatory programs 
and specialist advice across the regulatory spectrum, but with particular focus on prevention. So as I just mentioned, one of the major pieces of work um, that Comcare's psychosocial regulation team has been undertaking this year is the proactive psychosocial inspection program. The team carried out a pilot of this program between April and August of this year, and we'll be doing some additional inspections later this year. The program takes a three-tiered approach where inspectors engage with workers, health and safety representatives, and work health and safety teams, as well as senior leaders. So far, the team has visited three PCBUs or employers within the Commonwealth jurisdiction. And this, this has involved discussions with 115 workers, including health and safety representatives, and 59 senior leaders across those employers. At the conclusion of each inspection, a detailed inspector report is provided to the PCBU, along with resources to assist in meeting work health and safety obligations regarding psychosocial risk management. What you see now on your, on your screen there is an indication of the prevalence of each psychosocial hazard that was perceived as problematic by workers that um, inspectors spoke to across um, the inspections and across the course of the pilot inspection program. Hazards relating to the design or management of work were most frequently reported as a problem. Um, and you, those, those are the factors in the, um, uh, the maroon colored bars, if anyone's um, struggling to read the, uh, the legend on the slide there. Social factors or harmful behaviors were less prevalent, um, but this of course doesn't detract from the serious harm that these hazards may cause if they're not managed appropriately. Um, in terms of the prevalence overall, what our inspectors observed in the field is very similar to what was reported to us back at the webinars we held in April and May of this year. Um, and just as an aside, if you haven't checked those webinars out, um, please, please do so. They're available in recorded format on the Comcare website. What we're hearing um, is that job demands is the most prevalent hazard in workplaces. Um, and in particular, that it's a new challenge for work health and safety practitioners. So to zoom in a little further on this hazard, we thought today might be a good opportunity to discuss job demands in a little bit more detail. The Code of Practice provides us with a clear description of job demands. It says that job demands are sustained or intense, high levels of physical, mental or emotional effort, which are unreasonable or chronically exceed workers' skills. Job demands can also be sustained low levels of physical, mental or emotional effort. So essentially, Job demands is an imbalance between the demands of the work workers are performing and the resources available to navigate those demands. We should think here of resources as a holistic concept, which includes the number and skill of workers and the tools, systems and processes available to support the accomplishment of the work in question. So with all of this in mind, the Code of Practice provides specific examples of situations that could lead to high job demands. These include um, having a high workload, um, having too little to do in some instances, monotonous or repetitive tasks, sustained concentration or vigilance, repeatedly switching tasks, being required to be idle when there are high workloads, um, so, for example, here, when workers are required to wait for equipment um, or other workers while they're, um, while they're experiencing a high level of workload otherwise. Emotionally distressing situations, depressing emotions or just having to display false emotions in the context of work. Long or irregular working hours and insufficient breaks. So I thought we might just pause there and just ask for your participation um, if we can get the technology to work. So you should shortly see a poll question pop up in the chat window on the right hand side of the screen. Um, so please use the Teams polling function. If job demands, if you think that job demands are a problem in your workplace, we'd really love to hear 
which aspects of job demands, based on the, the discussion we've just had, are the most problematic in your workplace? And we'll just we'll just maybe give another 15 seconds for people to respond before we start looking at the responses. I can see them starting to come through, Luca. High workload is there. Got 120 odd responses so far. 36% high workload. Certainly looks like a, a popular one there. Yeah, emotionally distressing looks like it's second on the list. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Emotion, emotionally distressing situations is is very interesting because it does overlap. It can overlap with exposure to, to traumatic events. Um, so some people find it confusing that we include these 14 psychosocial hazards, but then have some some definitions that somewhat overlap. But really what what we're talking about here is a holistic concept. So it's, it is important to sort of take a step back from the particular hazard and thinking about the, the entire working um, environment. Having too little to do, Luca, it's 3%. So that's um, at least Not the most popular. this cohort it doesn't <laughs> appear to be a problem, but um, yeah. that's for uh, people in isolated locations or people who are at sort of lower levels in the organisation that may be more, more prevalent yeah. as a workplace hazard. Absolutely. I can see only 3% have said NA um, that job demands are a problem in their workplace. So, again, um, I think that um, our suspicions are probably on track when it comes to um, the significance of, of job demands within our, um, within our jurisdiction. So thank you all for your contributions. Um, we'll probably just leave the poll open and, and move on if anyone hasn't yet um, marked your um uh, uh, nominated which job demands are the biggest problem in your workplace. Um, but what I thought we could do now is just turn to um, some of the strategies that might be useful in um, overcoming the issue of um, of high job demands. Um, and I've based these, if anyone's interested, on um, some of the content within the code of practice, the model code of practice. Um, so what you can see here is um, examples. Uh, again, drawn from the code of practice um, that relate to the design of work or the, or the work environment, as well as modifying the job demands themselves or implementing safe systems and procedures. Now, I should also mention it's important not just to go for one risk control and to think about um, what, what could be done across, across the p potential options um, in order to achieve the best outcome and um, safeguard to the extent reasonably practicable against the risks um, that are present. So under the heading there, design of work, the examples include scheduling work to avoid intense or sustained workload pressure, planning shifts to allow adequate rest and recovery, and planning work to avoid large, large fluctuations in demand. Under work environment, the examples including use, include using IT systems that reduce the possibility of human error, providing quiet spaces for mentally demanding work, and optimising the design and layout of the workplace for the tasks being performed. To modify the demands themselves associated with the tasks, um, some options include planning the workforce to ensure that there's adequate staffing and skill mix, rostering sufficient workers to allow for breaks, and rescheduling non-urgent tasks if the demand is unexceptionally high. Sorry, unexpectedly high. Under the heading um, safe systems and procedures to minimise job demands, um, options include having regular conversations about work expectations, workloads, deadlines, and providing instructions, implementing systems for escalating problems when they arise, and minimising excessive approvals to avoid as much as possible duplication of work. You'll find more examples on pages 35 to 37 of the Model Code of Practice on how to manage psychosocial risks. I'll now hand over to Justin to talk about one of the most important elements in a safety management system, which is, of course, consultation. Yeah, thank you, Luca. So like other WHS issues, consultation is a key component of an effective psychosocial risk management system. 
It's also a legal requirement that PCBUs consult with workers in circumstances, including when identifying hazards, deciding on how to manage risks in response to those hazards, and proposing changes that may affect the health or safety of workers. In addition to this legal imperative, we have observed throughout the course of our proactive inspection program that when consultation is done well, workers tend to report that psychosocial risks are being well managed. One of the reasons that consultation is so important for psychosocial risk management is that unlike physical hazards, psychosocial hazards may be difficult to observe. This means that without effective consultation, it is more difficult, if not impossible, to identify and manage psychosocial risks effectively. I will just say that when ComCare inspectors visit workplaces, either proactively or reactively, we will seek evidence that that consultation with workers is in place and is effective, particularly as it relates to psychosocial hazards and risk assessments. So the next slide then, to supplement the model code, ComCare has published a suite of guidance material on our website, and I've seen some of this referenced in the chat so far today. Resources that may be of interest include the newly released Good Work Design resources, a suite of 10 short two to three minute videos and fact sheets on what great managers do, resources on the Mental Notes program, which are designed to assist in improving workplace culture and reducing stigma related to mental health in the workplace and a work demands guide for employers. You can also access our full catalogue of education and training on ComCare's learning management system. The best way to stay up to date on ComCare resources is by subscribing to the ComCare e-news. And we're always seeking to identify the needs of our jurisdiction when it comes to the development of new resources. And with that in mind, I was hoping to take this opportunity to ask the audience today if there, are any, if there is any particular information, guidance or resources that you would find useful when managing psychosocial hazards in your workplace. And I know in the chat so far today, there's been a whole range of suggestions here, so we very much appreciate that. So if you do have a suggestion, put it into the poll on Teams now. I might pause a moment and see whether there's any responses coming through. This. So we're after... Uh, what are particular useful topics or guidance or resources that uh, ComCare could look to develop to assist you in your work in assessing psychosocial risks and managing them in your workplace? So risk assessments, risk calculator, calculator tool, that's come up in the chat I've seen. There's been some chat about the people at work tool, which is one, one tool that may be appropriate and useful in your workplace. Information on job demands, mentoring, better managers. Conversation. A couple Sorry. there on um, reasonable adjustments as well, which is an interesting one that we haven't talked about today, but um, definitely within the patch of, within ComCare's patch, but more on the um, other side of our um, agency. But there's a lot there about managers too. We have spoken about the importance of leadership. There are duties under the Act for officers, but also those frontline managers, those people who manage it could be quite small teams, but building their capability uh, to have those conversations and to assess and identify the site risks that might exist in those workplaces. And I think we've said also that it's not a one, it ought not be a one size fits all approach. Some of the organisations that we regulate are geographically diverse, they do a whole range of different types of work, and really the risk assessment needs to be looking at each workplace and the type of work that's done. Sometimes we find that an organisation has done a sort of generic risk assessment for the whole business. To be effective, we're looking for more nuanced and uh, workplace-related assessments and controls. Anything else, Luca, you picked up? There's some interesting comments that are coming into the chat as well, just and outside of the poll. So I just wanted to mention that we'll be definitely looking at that um, after today's webinar. We'll, we'll take that into, into our... Um, consideration when we're thinking about the next round of resources that we can develop. Okay, well, we might move on. So thank you to everyone who's uh, contributed to the poll and the chat uh, function today. Uh, and just to 
sum up the, the presentation that Luca and I have just done, and we want to leave you with some key takeaways for what WHS leaders can do to promote psychosocial safety in workplaces. The first one there is to know the psychosocial hazards in your workplace and the controls to guard against them. We've spoken about that and the importance of consultation as part of that assessment of those controls. Really important also, and Georgie and Greg spoke about this, the need to communicate your commitment to psychosocial, psychological safety and follow through with visible actions. So that's the responsibility of leaders in the organisation, WHS teams, uh, managers, the whole way through the organisation. That sends a really powerful message to uh, workers in the organisation that there is a commitment to create and maintain psychosocial safety in the workplace. Listen and learn from colleagues, regardless of rank. And I had seen something in the chat about you know people not feeling perhaps empowered to have these conversations. And effective management of these risks requires uh, a, a culture that listens and learns and engages the workforce across all levels and be willing to share successes as well as opportunities for improvement. Now, we, we understand that this uh, Managing psychosocial risks is not easy. It's a lot more challenging, I think, than managing physical risks. So the importance of sharing the success as well as opportunities for improvement, we state that as, a, as an important part of that sort of building an effective culture. Next one is ensuring reporting and risk management systems are robust, trusted and monitored for effectiveness. There's been some, again, in the chat, some commentary around how do you measure uh, success in this space. Some of the things are lead indicators and the like, um, looking at the census results. There are other measures and we'll provide more material um, through, the, through the chat as well. But importance of reporting and measuring and having that conversation at the senior level and across the business. And lastly, that, uh, the one we've just mentioned previously, the importance of consulting with workers, empowering workers to participate in the risk management process and providing a safe environment for them to engage to raise any issues or concerns that they might have in the workplace. So just to sum it all up again, remember that psychosocial risk management is a central component of an effective work health, work health and safety management system. The benefits of psychosocial safety go beyond those of a moral or legal obligation and can include improved productivity, better employee engagement, and lower claims volumes and claims duration as well. So thank you for your time and your attention and interest in this important subject. Um, and uh, we're very happy to share some aspects of Comkey's approach to this work. I'll now hand back to Andrew for the next item on our agenda. Thanks, Justin and Luca. And again, so much uh, really valuable discussion going on in the chat with some really engaged participants with their own insights reflections and questions that are being shared. Uh, it is pretty complex for Comcare to respond directly to many of the specific questions that are being asked. So I would really encourage you, if you do have questions relating to Comcare's regulatory approach, uh, or you're after specific advice or guidance to contact Comcare's Work Health Safety Help Desk uh, at whs.help at comcare. .gov.au, where your questions can be considered and responded to uh, appropriately. Also, we did notice uh, some people uh, weren't able to access the polls. That may be an issue with your organisation's global settings, uh, and also it could be the device that you're uh, coming in from, because we did have um, at least 50% of the audience were able to engage. So uh, it is working, but unfortunately, maybe some settings issues there. So look now on to our next speaker. We've got Parman Schroeder, who will be discussing some of the latest research and approaches around vicarious trauma and how this may provide insights into other psychosocial hazards. Parman Schroeder is a research officer at the Institute for Safety, Compensation and Recovery Research, or ISCA for short. Her research focuses on psychosocial hazard prevention and draws on lived experience, co-design methods and capability building solutions. Her goal is to, for decisions to be informed by a genuine understanding of the challenges that are faced by workers and for workers to be empowered through active involvement in the decisions that affect them. Most recently, Carmen led the monitoring and evaluation of Preventing Vicarious Trauma Toolkit Pilot, which was a three and a half year collaboration between the Community Public Sector Union, 
to government departments and WorkSafe Victoria. The pilot aimed to develop proactive approaches to prevent vicarious trauma through drawing on knowledge and experience of frontline staff, management and subject matter experts. Not at work, Carmen enjoys playing boggle with her children and pottering in the garden. So welcome, Carmen. Thanks, Andrew. Um, and thanks everyone today. It's been really great um, to hear the, the speakers beforehand because they've set the scene perfectly for what I'm about to talk about. So as Andrew said, I'll be talking about preventing vicarious trauma and hopefully apply this to other psychosocial hazards. And it'll be really building on what's already been spoken about and hopefully this will be a really good applied example of what it looks like in the workplace. So I'll be talking a bit about what vicarious trauma is. Um, then I'll touch on some of the barriers about preventing vicarious trauma that we found through our research. And then hopefully some applied examples of um, some steps to take in preventing vicarious trauma in particular, but how these might work for other psychosocial hazards. Before I go too far though, um, we have found that when we we start talking about vicarious trauma with certain organisations and certain groups. Um, it can be a bit triggering. Um, we do have a few people note that, you know, they start to feel impacted or, or they have that aha moment that where they've been impacted by their work. Um, so please, if this is you and if there's anyone out there that, that is feeling like this, take a moment, um, reflect on why you're feeling that way and reach out and use whatever supports work for you and are available to you. So what is vicarious trauma? Um, the most simple definition that I've come up with in my work is that vicarious trauma is a predictable and human response to exposure to traumatic content. But what is traumatic content? It's essentially other people's trauma. And in the course of their work, a lot of workers are exposed to other people's trauma and they are really required to engage and work with this material. So it can come in many forms. Um, some examples are kind of written. So you might have case notes as a social worker where it's got details of um, a survivor's trauma experience. You might have verbal disclosures. Um, in a lot of professions, you'll have verbal disclosures and they might really come out of the blue. You might really think you know this client really well and then all of a sudden something really distressing pops up and, and they might tell you that. Um, we also might have it as something visual. So um, a lot of justice workers talk about crime scene images that can be quite distressing and explicit, or even audio visuals. So content reviewers on the internet is an example of that, that they're really having to see a lot of this footage and they're seeing it over and over again. The other thing to understand about vicarious trauma is that it builds up over time. Um, so you might think that this backpack is a bit of a funny image for that, but it's actually a great metaphor for, um, if you imagine having this backpack on and um, every time you hear some kind of distressing content, you pop a rock in your backpack. And, you know, you might not notice when it's not one rock or so, but with um, workers who expose this content day in, day out and throughout their whole career, this backpack gets heavy because you're just continually popping rocks in day in, day out, multiple rocks a day. And over time, this backpack gets very, very heavy. And that is essentially what vicarious trauma is. It's this build up over time and it really, something's got to give eventually. Um, the other thing to know about vicarious trauma is that it results in essentially PTSD symptoms. So um, even some, some of the recent editions of diagnostic manuals, they have um, indirect trauma as a cause of PTSD. Um, and we've also got symptoms plus here as um, vicarious trauma can also result in some of those exhaustion related symptoms. So it can be burnout or compassion fatigue. You can get these from other causes though. So that's why they're kind of PTSD plus symptoms. And it's good to know that vicarious trauma isn't always the cause of burnout or compassion fatigue. The other plus represents um, these negative changes to wellview. And this is really what makes vicarious trauma quite distinct from PTSD. Um, and burnout and compassion fatigue and things like that. And so the best example I can give of, um, of negative changes in worldviews is I interviewed someone once and they were a justice worker and they'd been working with um, perpetrators of domestic violence and domestic violence survivors. And with men overwhelmingly being the perpetrators of domestic violence, over time, um, this person really started to fear men. And they found that when they were out in the community, they'd be looking at strangers, at men and, and thinking, what are you capable of? And then they would, they would um, be quite nervous with their children around men. And it wasn't until we actually sat down and discussed vicarious trauma as a part of a project that they went, oh, wow, this is what's happening to me. 
Um, so you can really see that slow build up over time. It's, it's almost um, unnoticeable. And this is why often vicarious trauma is described as a silent hazard. The other thing that's interesting about vicarious trauma is this, um, the, the waiting it, it empty is, is involved in it. So empty is essentially a precondition for vicarious trauma. You can't be impacted by the work if you're not engaging empathically with it. The challenge is in a lot of these caring professions or trauma environments, empathy is essential to do your job well. Um, you can't, a lot of employers will say, or a lot of employees will say, I can't do my role if I'm not engaging empathy, empathetically with my clients. I can't build rapport. I can't understand what they're going. But this essentially results in them sharing the experience and resulting in kind of those symptoms that I talked about earlier. So why am I talking about vicarious trauma today? Like what makes it so important? So one thing to understand is the difference between direct trauma and vicarious trauma and the context that it occurs in. So you can see on the left here, we've got the gray um, arrow and that's talking about exposure to a traumatic events. So in the workplace context, this could context, this could be things like um, occupational violence and aggression, but also when we think about emergency responders, there might be some incidents that they have to respond to that are quite traumatic um, and that they probably have to do that quite frequently. And this results essentially in a PTSD response of some sort in most cases. And on the right, we've got the blue arrow that's talking about exposure to traumatic content. So vicarious trauma more rather than direct trauma. And this results in a PTSD plus response. So you can see they both kind of result in a similar response, but it's the context that they, they care in that really makes them different and how we address them um, um, different. So exposure to traumatic events tends to happen with a low level of control. It tends to be unpredictable. We don't know when it's going to happen. It's usually physically dangerous and includes threats to life. It might overwhelm your capacity to cope in the moment. And it's often a one-off event when you're, when you're impacted. Vicarious trauma, on the other hand, is inherent in what someone's doing. And therefore it's predictable. We know people are going to be exposed to traumatic content in the course of their work. It also occurs in physically safe environments. And it's also cumulative, as I said before. And it's this context here that really makes, it really creates the perfect opportunity to look at how we can prevent vicarious trauma. We know that it's inherent in certain roles. We know where in those roles people are going to be exposed to vicarious trauma. And so we know that we can actually start looking at what could we do to, to, to design these jobs better so people aren't as impacted and they're actually protected before they're impacted. The other thing to know about vicarious trauma, and this is quite big, that research is showing that up to 50% of workers exposed to um, traumatic content in the course of their work um, are at risk of mental injury. Now that's huge. So it's only in specific professions at this stage and it's very difficult to measure in terms of how they're measuring this, but it's that's a huge statistic. If we had 50% of workers coming home with a broken arm, we wouldn't accept that condition, those conditions and we would be doing something about it. But with vicarious trauma, you'll often find that there is actually not much in place or the policy that is in place is quite flimsy. Um, the other, the other um, factors about why vicarious trauma is so important is it's a hazard across many occupations. So the research is exploding at the moment. It's really finding, you know, um, you know, we've got emergency responders, healthcare workers, psychologists, teachers. We've been studying some research in teachers, um, housing, you know, across the public sector. It's huge. Um, it's really, it's, it, it can be a risk anyway. Even if you think about people like receptionists in the front line and they're answering phones, and you might think that they're not exposed, but they're often the first point of contact and they're getting a lot of people who, um, are quite distressed and desperately seeking services. And so they get a lot of these details about how, how pe what people are experiencing and how much they need their support. So it's really important to think about what occupations can be affected because the research is still catching up on this. Um, the other thing that we've found is that learnings from vicarious trauma actually have quite broad application to other psychosocial hazards. And I'll, I'll build on this a little bit more as I, I speak further. And um, as we've just heard, there's legislation and regulation that really require workplaces to start addressing this. Um, and it really varies depending on your jurisdiction. But this is a real opportunity to get ahead of the game, um, depending on what regulation is in place. So what did we do? What, why am I here talking to you? Um, as um, Andrew said in the intro, I've been working on a three and a half year project about preventing vicarious trauma in the public sector. So what did that look like? 
Um, we had six pilot sites across two government departments. Um, and so that was in justice and in public housing. Uh, we had working groups in each of our pilot sites and these working groups were made up of frontline staff as well as management representatives, OHNS, um, people with some decision making um, power so we could get either decisions made or even funding for certain actions that we put in place. But we also had subject matter experts which we, we really found were kind of a key player in, in helping drive the project forward. We also had a steering committee that oversaw the implementation of the whole project, and that included um, kind of executive reps from each of the departments, research organisation and the union. And essentially each of our pilot sites put in place this action planning process. And it started with engaging stakeholders, which was the working group. So it was really about making sure we had the right people at the table. Like it was really important we had that decision making capacity but that we had the people that would be implemented by the actions on, at the table too. So we could make sure we were really implementing what really needed, what was really needed. Next, we looked at collecting data. Um, and so this is really where it's been so lovely to hear all morning that people are talking about consultations. So we really undertook a broad consultation phase where we did some surveys, but we also um, spoke with frontline um, providers. And so we had a lot of focus groups we interviewed management representatives, OHS, and we really um, varied this to the context. So some of our sites were quite small and then we kept it a bit smaller. But when they were larger, we, we tried to really make sure we were representing the whole um, organisation or the service unit that we were working with. Um, we used a survey called the Vicarious Trauma Organisational Readiness Guide. Um, and that was actually quite interesting that you could use it as a survey. We actually found it actually worked quite well as a, a checklist as well as making sure that we had all these things in place. So it's just interesting way of um, like good to mention that not all tools need to be used exactly as prescribed and you need you can be flexible with what works in your environment. So from this, we then in each pilot site determined priorities for that site, not across all six sites. Um, and then each site developed an action plan. The action plan was ideally implemented. And then we went back to the engaged stakeholders phase. Do we have the right people at the table? And then, you know, back to collecting data and on and on. And on. Um, as I've said, what was really important to making this work or um, ensuring it was that the actions were tailored to the context was embedding lived, lived experience. So we had lived experience on the working groups. We also had lived experience in the consultation phase, but then we also um, used co-design methods. So with all of our actions, we tried to work with frontline staff or those who would be involved in this action and those who would be impacted to really make sure we designed it properly. We also used action research. So this kind of um, phase we used at a micro level at each of our pilot sites, but we also used it as a macro level across the whole pilot and constantly tweaking and changing what we were doing. It felt like a lot of chaos at the time, but um, it was really important to do that because we learned so much as we went on. And any time that we became fixed on some kind of idea, it tended to fail. Um, the other thing to note is that the whole pilot targeted systematic prevention. So we really wanted to shift this focus on individual responsibility um, to pre prevent psychosocial hazards and vicarious trauma and have a look at the system and what we could do about organisation wide and about job design and um, really shift to, to that prevention proactive kind of perspective. So what did we find? Um, first, we found hugely high rates of exposure to traumatic content. So people um, really, I think someone described it as a conveyor belt of traumatic content. Um, it was described, the content was described as um, explicit, distressing. Um, it was, you know, I have an abundance of quotes on how awful the content that people were engaging with was. Um, and interestingly, even though each of our pilot sites engaged in the same um, process. We had really mixed success across pilot sites. Um, and so we started to look at why this was and, and what was really happening. Um, and this led us to some barriers to prevention. And so there are the usual ones, um, you know, funding, resourcing, workload, and all of those, those kinds of things came up. But what we actually um, found was there was this workplace culture. And I think people have touched on it a bit this morning. And this is kind of a really applied example of what it can look like when workers aren't heard and when they don't feel valued. 
Um, so the first quote says, it just kind of feels like the only thing that's ever offered is EAP. And not that that's not good service. It feels like lip service, like the care factor's not there. So they're really not feeling like they're cared about by their organisation or even their supervisors or managers. Um, it was really common for people to be concerned about being performance managed. So there's a quote here, you'd be put on a performance plan if you were really having difficulty coping. And if you go back to my definition of vicarious trauma is that it's a normal human response to exposure to traumatic content. So why are we performance managing someone who's, who's having a human response to their work? Um, and the last quote says is, how our supervisors handle these sorts of discussions. There is a disconnect between how we're feeling and how we want it addressed because we don't know how that's going to play out. So again, you can see there's fear, but I really want to tap into this idea of disconnect because when I actually interviewed managers and supervisors, they talked a lot about how they cared about their staff and how they really wanted to care about their staff and they wanted to do what was best for their staff. Um, so there, there is this disconnect and a lot of managers were quite surprised when this data came out. Um, so it's really interesting to see that this comes out. But really what happened was that there was this, this kind of underlying tone of fear. Um, there was definitely a stigma associated with vicarious trauma and kind of that um, asking for help and raising a red flag. Um, and all of this resulted in inaction. And then when we dug a little bit deeper, and we really tried to push forward with kind of challenging this culture and addressing this disconnect. We found that there was more to it. So underlying this kind of inaction were these dominant perceptions of vicarious trauma. And as I go through them, they're not gonna be as a, as a surprise to most of you. Um, they're, they're, pro, they're, they're cognitive biases that I think I learned about in year 12 psychology. Um, they're, they're really not surprising, but what's interesting is how much, how much of an impact they have even though we're quite aware of these, these perceptions. So the first is um, this clinical idea. And, and the idea here is that only psychological treatment and expertise can help. So if you're impacted by vicarious trauma and you, you, you seek help, you're most likely going to be referred to EAP as the quote earlier said. You might get some other kind of service. I know that other, um, some of the sites that we worked with had a psychological wellbeing service, but basically you're gonna get referred to EAP. Another symptom of this kind of approach is that there's a really big focus on symptoms. So I can't count the amount of times when I've said to someone, what would you like to know about vicarious trauma? And they say the symptoms, tell me the symptoms. But again, as Georgie said this morning, um, then we're looking in the rear view mirror. If we're looking for symptoms, we're looking in the rear view mirror and it, it's already almost too late. When we know the context and we know that people are going to be exposed to traumatic content, why aren't we doing more to prevent it? The next perception was that it's an individual problem. Um, so then it needs to be managed by the individual. And then this tends to look like workplace in interventions. So all, these are organisation-wide interventions when people say, oh, we've got a policy on vicarious trauma. It actually, once you read through it, it, it promotes self-care and it just puts the whole responsibility on the individual to, to pre um, prevent vicarious trauma. Um, and I've seen some very, very entertaining examples of what self-care look like. But when you actually talk to frontline workers and a lot of employees, you'll actually find they know how to look after themselves and they've all got really, really healthy um, and proactive self-care strategies in place and that they're actually hoping and looking for the organisation to do more about it. The other is this resilience narrative. So again, when I go into organisations and I say, what do you do by, by, about very vicarious trauma? And they say, all our employees have resilience training. And A, resilience training usually goes for an hour. Um, but also resilience isn't um, what is needed in this, in this context. Yes, resilience is important, um, but any response to exposure can't really be put down to resilience when, again, it's a human reaction um, to be impacted by traumatic content. Um, the, the impact of this ends up being that coping is a requirement of the job. So there, there's a lot of talk about that person can cope or can't cope or I, if I can't cope, again, I'll be performance managed. This idea of coping is really entrenched in our um, organisations. And the last is that it's inherent. So exposure is essential. It's, it's core to our jobs. Um, it can't be removed. So therefore, workers just need to get on with it. We all just need to get on with it. Now, I'm not saying any of these things aren't important or aren't accurate. So there is definitely a role for EAP or, or expertise um, there's a time and place for it, and it's, it's crucial, especially when people are recovering and they need support for recovery. 
Um, individuals definitely have a role in preventing vicarious trauma, but not in place of the workplace having a role. Um, and yes, resilience is a really important thing to have, but um, it's not the only thing that can, can prevent vicarious trauma. So what does prevention look like? The first thing um, we found was this need to reframe the psychosocial hazards. Um, and so that's best done through awareness and education. But as we've, like I've seen a lot in the chat this morning and what we've talked about a lot, um, all, all the speakers, is we really need this to be leadership led. We really need leaders to be open to how we're talking about hazards in the workplace, how we understand hazards and what we expect our organisations and our employees to do in response to those hazards. The other thing is to acknowledge psychosocial hazards and label them as hazards. Um, they, you know, we need to talk about risk in the workplace and have people know what that is. And the other thing to think about is the language we use around vicarious trauma or, or even psychosocial hazards in general. So a really good example is from this project that I had a lot of managers and in the pilot sites that were successful that really shifted their language from not if you are affected, but when you are affected. So then people didn't feel like it was um, a shortcoming in themselves or a lack of ability to cope um, because it was when you were affected. There was an expectation that you would be affected and therefore we will try and do everything we can to, pro protect, to protect you. The next um, step is understanding the context. And this is, again, this idea of consultation. It is so important. And a lot of places when we started out in this project, a lot of um, our, the executives on our steering committee would tell us we've got policies in place, we've got training in place, everything's fine. But then when we went and spoke to frontline staff, they would say the policy doesn't work or isn't applied, um, the training is you know, hit and miss and not everyone gets it. So we really need to know what is happening in the context. What are the hazards and how and when do they occur? They occur. So who is being exposed to traumatic content? Um, and what kind of content is it? Um, who is affected? Like it, it really depends on the content and the rate of content on how affected you are. Um, again, the, the, the policies that are in place and what do they target? Are, are they just promoting self-care again? When are, I've said earlier, employees know how to care for themselves. What else could our policies target? And this is best done through a combination of surveys, but also consultations. Staff really want to be heard and there's not thing, there's things that you can't pick up in a survey. And often I found when I went and spoke to frontline staff and I would say, you know, what do you want done about this? They could list off, you know, they had a whole list of things that they as a team had decided that they would do. And it would be quite simple for that organisation to grab that strategy and apply it across their organisation. And it's just come from staff. You know, I've trawled endless amounts of research and not found as good examples as I have from talking directly with, with the workers who are doing the work. And the last is implement a tailored response. So this response is essentially informed by the context. So it's really tailored to whatever you've learned from your staff and making sure it works for them. The other thing is to consider um, policies along the prevention spectrum, which um, Luca touched on before, and that's that, that idea of having them um, proactive strategies, but also having these treatment or reactive strategies in place to make sure that people are um, supported to heal if they are impacted. It's also really important to cater for individual preferences. Um, what works for one person won't work for another. Um, and I have this really good memory of um, interviewing someone and they were saying that I don't need anything, I don't need any supports, um, I'm fine, I've been doing this work for 40 years, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, and then when we actually unpacked it some more, they were saying that we found out that they worked, they drove home every day from work with their partner who worked in a similar field and they debriefed for 45 minutes on the way home every day. And so they didn't need counselling at work. They didn't need support from different people in the workplace because they had a really good support mechanism outside of work. So what works for one person might not work for the other. Um, the other thing to consider is what other psychosocial hazards are in play. You can't really address them in isolation. And here it's really about thinking that not one size fits all. Um, and I think Georgie already said that this morning. It's really important to, to have an array of strategies in place that can um, work for different psychosocial hazards, different people and different parts of the spectrum. And so now I've said all of that. But what does it actually look like? So I was going to initially end my um, presentation here, but I thought I'd give a bit of an applied example of what this looked like in our pilot sites. 
So each of our pilot sites um, had an action plan. And you can see here there is um, a priority area across the top. Um, and then that was kind of um, kind of made a bit more specific as a goal. So something that was a bit more achievable. And then we had actions underpinning each of these goals. Um, it was attributed to someone who took responsibility for that, usually in our working group, but occasionally we had to reach out to someone else. And then there were notes taken and timeline kind of we might have allocated, we need this done by this date. And then we talked about progress. And basically these were updated every month when the working group met and whoever had been allocated some kind of responsibility came back and reported back to the group. So the first thing, um, what was very common across our pilot sites and what's been very common in the chat today is support and debriefing. So we really found that that was lacking um, despite many policies in place that said um, specific types of support were available, there was this huge gap as, as the quotes um, exemplified earlier. And so one of um, the strategies or the goals that one of our pilot sites put in place was embed BT, vicarious trauma discussion in supervision. Um, and so some of the actions here included trainings for supervisors. And what was interesting really um, with here was that supervisors went off and got together and they discussed how, how it felt to support staff with vicarious trauma. And initially they were very hesitant and saying they needed to be trained and they needed skills, um, they needed expertise, back to that kind of clinical um, perception. But once they met a few times, they actually realized they could support each other quite well. And they actually started developing their own framework and their own skills between themselves on how they could address vicarious trauma and support staff to address vicarious trauma in their workplace. And then this also led to the development of wellbeing plans. And this was half staff led and half supervisor led that these wellbeing plans were not designed. And it included things like what my triggers are, how I'm impacted, so how does stress look like for me and how I like to be supported. So these things were talked about before people were impacted. And it gave supervisors um, a framework for discussing um, these things with staff but it also gave um, frontline employees the, the opportunity to understand what they need and know before they're impacted what supports in the workplace are there for them, but also how they like to be supported. Another um, approach that to all of our pilot sites wanted actually was to implement reflective practice. And that was to kind of bridge the gap between managers um, and, and actually kind of bring a bit more peer support um, in place, but also to um, break that taboo and the stigma around vicarious trauma. And you can see here, it was very, um, you know, source provider source funding. It did take about 12 months for it to get this funding in place and to get it rolling. But we actually found that once it was implemented, it was actually incredible for vicarious trauma in particular. And it really broke the stigma and it really, um, the group that participated in these six sessions really came out with a new perspective on work and were really able to have these discussions, not just with the participants of reflective practice, but they were more open in the workplace and able to address um, incidences and stress in the workplace. Another example is just acknowledging hazards. So um, they, this one site really looked at how they could embed discussion of vicarious trauma in their processes. So a really simple example is adding a vicarious trauma question to recruitment procedures. And I think this came up in the chat earlier. Um, and it was amazing. I've got some quotes from people saying that it was really interesting being in those interviews and seeing the looks on people's faces like, wow, it's, it's being acknowledged, it's being addressed before they've even started with the organisation. So it's out there, it's in the open, and people know that the organisation is, is acknowledging the risk. Um, they also added vicarious trauma activities to staff meetings. So just really simple questions, comments, how, how are you going this week, any distressing exposure. There was a lot of examples of different activities. They also created a wellness Wednesdays where they just had wellness activities on Wednesday morning and people could discuss those. So hopefully, you know, the, the action plans that we actually had went across multiple pages and on and on, and they all looked a lot messier than this. But this is just a few simple examples to hopefully get your, your mind rolling. Um, so yeah, to summarise, as I've said, vicarious trauma is, an, is a predictable human response to exposure to traumatic content, and it's a hazard in a lot of workplaces. Um, and how these hazards are understood and framed can really act as a barrier for, to prevention. So really try and understand what's happening in your workplace and what the workplace culture is around psychosocial hazards, because it's, that's going to need to be tackled outright. And then prevention includes reframing these hazards and education and awareness, 
but also again just to reiterate what everyone said this morning is consult your staff understand their experience and then develop a tailored response um, in, in to that thanks so much for listening everyone and back to you andrew thank you carmen um, yes and so many reactions uh, positive reactions there uh, again lots of uh, uh, comments, questions, uh, and remarks in the chat there, and some of which we'll um, try to include in our panel discussion, which is coming up next. Uh, so about to move into our final session of the forum, um, we just popped up a poll uh, there for you, um, and we'll have another poll in there also. So moving into this final session, on our panel today, we've got Connie Galati, who's our Senior Clinical Psychologist from the Australian Public Service Commission's Mental Health Suicide Prevention Unit. Uh, we've again got Luca Campbell, Director of Comcare's Natural, National Regulatory Programs, and Carmen Schroeder from ISCA, who you've just heard from in the previous session. And the topic of this panel session is going to be around translating theory into practice. So it's around managing psychosocial hazards in the workplace, uh, looking sort of at tips, tricks and traps when we're trying to translate that theory into practice. Uh, and great to see that so many people have responded to the, um, uh, to the polls. Uh, and again, we've also asked uh, about your most significant challenge in addressing psychosocial hazards in a word or two. We can see lots of um, issues coming up around leadership and management. So this will also be some um, good food for conversation for the um, for the polls as well. So that's um, great. Thank you. So to get into our panel, our first question. Carmen's just been discussing some of the approaches for dis addressing vicarious trauma and how these could be used across other psychosocial hazards. Do others want to reflect on how some of those concepts might translate across some of the other domains of psychosocial hazard? We might start with um, Connie, I guess, from the APSC. Would you like to kick off? I'm looking for sound there. Have we got the sound coming through, Connie? There we go. Thank you. Sorry, it wouldn't Terrific. unmute. Um, thank you. Uh, Carmen, a lot of your presentation really resonated with me. There's uh, lots of common philosophies and I think a lot that we can um, benefit from in terms of those lessons applied more broadly. That support and debriefing piece, I, I think sometimes, I, I feel really lucky as a psychologist, um, we've really got robust support structures and structures that aren't just at that early career stage, but expected of you, even as a veteran in your career, you know, 17 years on, I still see a clinical supervisor. And part of that is not only about reflective practice and continuous development of, of my skill, but just as a check-in. And I do think sometimes, why don't we do this more regularly with all professions? Um, and and coming back to that idea of, of clinical, I must be the most non-clinical clinical psychologist ever because I really do believe there is value in support at work, those connections at work. And we really need to invest, as Georgie said earlier, in, in people. And so I think when it comes down to looking at um, managing psychosocial hazards, a really good first step is looking at it through the people lens, not through a mental illness lens, not through, um, uh, 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 you know, something harmful is going to happen, but just who are our people? How do we connect with them? And not just expecting that it's the role of someone else, um, whether that be always the manager or, or, or that psychologist or EAP. So I think coming back down to basics, how can I have some embedded support structures in place? How do we as an organisation uh, support our staff to access that? How do we be more proactive? Um, I love seeing my clinical supervisor because when you've built trust, they call things out. Hey, Connie, you've got the, some bags under your eyes. Are you not sleeping? Hey, uh, what's going on? And so you need these proactive support structures in place, but I don't think they need to be reserved for people who are doing high impact or em emotional load work. I think this can be something that really benefits all workers and is a great way to, to invest in, in what I would call collective resilience. You know, let's move away from individual resilience and invest in, in the team and the group at work. Thanks, Connie. Thanks. 
yeah thanks i might add a few words if you don't mind andrew just in terms of how we would probably think about this from a re regulator's perspective um i couldn't agree more with with what connie said and and thank you very much carmen for your um very insightful um presentation um i think we we really have to think about we have to hold two things in tension here which are that we have to understand that individuals respond differently to different types of stimulus um, whether it's you know traumatic events or other types of psychosocial hazards in the workplace and we have to we have to acknowledge that and understand that and not blame the individual for their response to that um, to that hazard um, while at the same time thinking about the work environment generally in the system of work which could give rise to that kind of a response from an individual and that's quite challenging because you know when we compare this to a physical hazard the the um the response that an individual might have to a physical hazard in the workplace is is not going to be subject to so much variation depending on individual factors um so what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that the system of work is really what can give rise to the hazard. And that's where our focus should be when we're undertaking preventive um, activities in the workplace. Um, the, the work health and safety legislation sets out quite a clear model for how to manage psychosocial risks. Um, and it requires something a little bit different to physical hazards. Um, there's a set of specific things that an employer needs to consider when implementing risk controls to manage psychosocial risk. And it includes things like how the hazards might interact or combine. Um, it also includes considering job demands in the event that another psychosocial hazard has been identified and, and uh, is being managed. So the, the, the picture that's being painted there is that it really requires a holistic look a holistic analysis of the exposures that the work may give rise to um, and consideration of design of how a system of work can be designed to to really minimize um, the impact of those hazards um, and the, the potential harm that they, that may, they may cause and on the flip side look at the positives that can be accomplished by actually setting up um, health, healthy and safe working environments um, the flip side, of course, the positive benefits aren't what are what's prescribed by the legislation, but I think there's a very clear business case to be made in terms of the benefits that it can accrue in terms of um, creating mentally healthy workplaces. Thanks. So um, Carmen mentioned uh, a number of narratives, um, so four narratives that were part of um, what they had seen when looking at workplaces. And we've got a question that's come through the audience, or a few questions actually, uh, that really kind of relate to this, which is around where certain hazards exist already in the work as part of the nature of the job or um, an inherent part of that particular task or activity. Um, how should um, psychosocial hazards or obligations apply in those circumstances, or how should an uh, employer interface with those where it's already an established part of the role uh, and um, considered or perceived as being an inherent uh, part. Uh, maybe Luca, if you could kick off and we'll rotate around. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, th this is a great question. We get asked questions similar to this um, and our inspectors get asked questions um, similar to this relatively frequently. So I'm really glad it came up today. Um, and my response would be um, to really try and reframe that question. Um, from inherent risks um, associated with the, the job um, to um, whether there are um, characteristics of the work um, that make elimination of the hazard um, difficult, challenging, or even not reasonable. The reason why I'd, I'd flip it that way and I'd, I'd try and reframe it is because the work health and safety um, regime is set up to continually ratchet up the standard of health and safety that we we can expect in workplaces. It's designed that way so that it's not fixed in a point of in a point in time where we we lay out prescriptive 
requirements on exactly what needs to be done and exactly what is and what isn't acceptable. The standard um, set by the reasonably practicable test increases over time as we learn more about what can give rise to these risks to health and safety and what can be done about, um, about those risks um, in a workplace. So having said all of that, there are some types of work um, where, um, where management of the risk can be, be more challenging and elimination may, at this point in time, not be reasonably practicable. So in those circumstances, I would say, go back to the um, how to manage risks code of practice. Look at what um, level two and level three risk controls can be implemented. Um, so they're things like engineering, risk control, um, isolating people from the hazard, um, as well as implementing appropriate training um, and procedures and administrative controls, including PPE, um, to make sure that holistically people are prevented from exposure to that hazard as far as reasonably practicable. Um, a good example perhaps is in our um, in a, in a kind of law enforcement um, or policing environment um, where um, the risk of exposure to violence and aggression might be higher in that in that particular type of work. Um, now we might think that it's not it's not reasonably practicable in all instances to eliminate that hazard because the role does require interaction with the public and of course we can't completely control how individuals in the community might behave in a particular context. But there are a range of options to manage that risk at a level two and level three um, in the hierarchy of controls. Um, and I'm sure if you've if you've seen a police officer, you'll see that they're often wearing personal protective equipment. They're often often, in, often working not just alone but with other other workers. Um, there's obviously procedures, training and um, and really clear administrative guidance on um, how that work of that nature is to be done and it includes planning so to making sure that there's adequate number of um, of workers to do particular tasks that that may involve exposure to that hazard so the kind of takeaway that i would you know to try and wrap up the point that i'm trying to make here is that um, the concept of reasonably practicable is not fixed in time um, and the standard that we can expect should should increase over time as we learn more about work health and safety risks including psychosocial hazards and for that reason i just encourage um, a rethinking of the inherent risks in the job kind of concept um, and i think i'd like to add to what you're saying luca is that uh, for a lot of these jobs, um, people are attracted to them for particular reasons. There's value in the work, um, it aligns with their personal values, they want to contribute to community. There's a acceptance to a point of some of the risk because of the rewards that come from it, provided those workplace systemic controls are there to eliminate or mitigate to the extent that is possible um, how those psychosocial hazards are experienced. So we shouldn't be a f uh, we shouldn't fear some of this work because actually people can experience a lot of rewards and thrive in the role. Um, and neither should we have a a, a one size fits all approach. Um, Carmen talked about the cumulative impact, for instance, of, of vicarious trauma and, and very much uh, um, individualised. You know, what an incident that may not have affected me five years ago may affect me today because my personal circumstances have changed. For instance, um, working uh, uh, with a, a child that's been harmed versus five years later, I'm now a parent and that has now changed my, my world view. So that idea of it being inherent is 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 not quite true because um, how I've responded to 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 the psychosocial hazards uh, may change and, and really what is the constant should be the investment the workplace um, makes to support me into the role um, so that I can 
experience the benefits as opposed to experience the harms. Yeah, thanks, Connie. That's a, that's a great point, point, Connie, about the rewards of the work. And there is a lot of work with vicarious trauma around, around vicarious resilience that you can actually learn to become resilient from working with these trauma survivors. Um, in our project, we actually had an interesting, um, what we asked at the beginning of the project, um, what are you exposed to and what could be removed in terms of traumatic content? And no one came up with anything. Not a single person had anything. They said, it's all inherent in my work. I can't remove it. And then at the end of the project, when we asked that question again, we actually had a, a lot of ideas come up. So a lot of um, justice workers said, I see crime scene images and I don't need to see them as a part of my role. Um, that, that's what really distresses me, but it wasn't without the awareness raising and the education and labeling vicarious trauma as a hazard, that people were empowered then to, to be able to identify what was the risk in their workplace. So there are, there are, you know, we'll never be able to remove traumatic content from the work um, when we're using vicarious trauma as an example, but there are ways to minimize or modify and, and change the way we are exposed to those hazards. Um, and so there's always opportunity. And I think it comes back to, to really labeling hazard, hazards and acknowledging those risks. So not brushing them under the carpet and, and not pretending they're not there or that there's nothing we can do about it. Um, and I think that's really the first step in all of it. Yeah, thank you. And quite a few comments coming through around um, education sector as well and some of the um, the challenges um, in the education sector. So I got another question here, which has um, come up through the registration uh, quite a bit, which is around learning lessons from organisations that are creating mentally healthy workplaces and appear to be managing it well. Uh, we might kick off with um, you, Connie, this this time. If you've um, if you've seen good examples and uh, things that seem to be um, working well. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I guess what I want to acknowledge, and, and, and probably this is uh, a well-known fact to all of you on the line, is that working in this space can has its challenges. And, and often the challenges are because what we're dealing with, what we're working with, is not visible. So it's, you know, we it's we've talked about those links with looking at physical risks. You know, it's tangible. We can see it. The, the, the solution or the intervention might seem obvious. So... Um, I really want to acknowledge that that this is a hard, difficult space to work with, but we can lean into that complexity and, and we can try and make visible some of those um, uh, invisible um, solutions. Um, I always, and our team always encourages agencies to really start small and basic. You can have really great programs and initiatives, but if some of the basics aren't um, undertaken, then uh, that might reduce some of the effectiveness. So for instance, if you have a peer support program in your workplace, but I don't know as a worker how to access that program because there's no intranet page, um, I don't have a list of who the peer supporters are, then you've got an initiative which, and there may be very, uh, very many more uh, aspects to this, but you've got an initiative that's not going to be as effective purely because it hasn't been communicated well. So making sure you do refreshes on your internet page, think about what are the common things staff are going to type into the search engine so that they can get to where they need to um, be. Um, we really like agencies to think about this being continuous improvement. So you don't have to take on everything all at once in the one year. Think about the quick wins, but think about one or two things you can do in this 12 months and focus on those um, because we know that this is evolving. We don't have a to-do list that we can fortunately check off and then that's done. We never have to look at this again. The nature of psychosocial hazards will also change as, as work develops. So keep it simple in, in a complex space. Um, and so we've got agencies who have done that, who are thinking about this from that lens. I think the other thing is when you are doing your assessment tools, um, we in the APS Mental Health Suicide Prevention Unit, we have a APS Mental Health Capability Framework. This looks at the six domains agencies need to invest in. Um, 
And so this can be used alongside other assessment tools, but this really looks at the governance systems of your mental health system in an agency. We have a tool that they can use to, to self-assess how much investment are, are we making in these different areas. And what we're finding is sometimes we can inadvertently in, over-invest in, in some areas and under-invest in others. And I think this comes back to that tangibility aspect of visible. So it's really common, not just in the APS, but across the industry um, in terms of what we've um, observed, that agencies will over-invest, say, in capability trainings, but under-invest in, in job design. Design. So um, a pr we've had really good examples where agencies have used this tool and gone, right, we're doing really well in capability. Let us continue doing what we're doing there. We don't need to reinvest in that for this year. We need to invest in something else, whether that be that intranet refresh that we're missing a policy on how to manage um, how to uh, uh, we're missing a policy around suicide prevention or we actually need to do job design on a specific branch who are uh, uh, work have high emotional load so keeping it simple of course you you still need to do this within the realms of the legislation but try to the extent that's possible um, do get the basics right as 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 part of your initiatives Andrew um, I might just add and um and um, Connie, I hope I'm not putting you in the spotlight here, but I, <laughs> I should. I just wanted to mention I've att I attended a webinar that um, that Co Connie contributed to a few weeks ago, which was really terrific. Um, and I believe it's available on the APSC um, website. So perhaps we can distribute a link as along with the notes from um, today's um, presentation. Um, but it was on um, the link between the APS value of integrity. Um, and creating um, psychologically safe um, environments um, in, in the APS. I thought that was a really terrific link to be made, um, and I certainly learned a lot from it. Um, and it, it was targeted at the sort of EL2 level, sort of the middle um, management level within the APS. So for anyone in the audience today that's not part of the Australian Public Service, um, you may still benefit from, from that at sort of the middle management um, level um, and it tackled the challenge between um, having to manage you know manage up and influence up in terms of creating um, a psychologically safe um, environment and also obviously looking at your sphere of influence in terms of the team that you manage day to day um, and I think that was a really good thing to point out because we do often get questions about what can I do I'm you know not a senior leader in the organization I can't make change on my own um, and I, I left that webinar um, uh, with a lot of a lot of sort of new ideas about how um, middle managers can actually be leaders in um, in, in, in changing organizational culture um, so I would highly recommend that that webinar <laughs> um, I also just wanted to add um, that uh, Georgie touched on some really important things this morning in terms of leadership um, culture um, and having a having a compassionate style of leadership, which really is emblematic of um, strong leadership. And perhaps we should think about strong leadership as being compassionate leadership and perhaps using those terms interchangeably, because um, I really do think that um, showing some being courageous and showing some vulnerability can actually give permission for workers and, and other people in the workplace to also um, talk about um, vulnerabilities and, and talk about issues that might be affecting their mental health. Um, and that discussion is really important to be able to understand what, what changes might be needed in the workplace in order to um, get the best out of people when they come to work and obviously meet um, obligations to manage work health and safety risks effectively. Um, so it's not all it's not all about leadership, but it is a very important element of good work health and safety risk management. So having that leadership tone right um, is um, is probably a, a really good starting point if there are senior leaders in the audience today, I would really encourage you to um, engage in this topic um, and think about the tone that you're setting and, and um, whether it's one that promotes psychosocial um, safety in the workplace. And it, it really is about interpersonal skills, 
um, and self-awareness enabling what we're trying to do here. I think that's what I'm kind of hearing and um, I guess I just want to acknowledge that despite being called the Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Unit, a key component of the work we're doing supporting staff and managers to build those relational skills because they are really at the core of mental health, well-being, uh, good leadership, good psychosocial hazard management. Um, it, 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 it's the boundary spanner. And so we've got um, a few e-learnings that really focus on, um, it is only available for Australian public service, but really focus on developing that interpersonal capability, not just at the manager level, which of course is critical and at the leadership level, but all of us, we all have that responsibility to to develop our relational skills um, and not just for the benefit of mental health and well-being but I all kinds of other elements you know even around supporting uh, neurodiversity in the workplace diversity in, in inclusion in, in in general so yeah this is a, a real focus of ours in in the unit recognizing uh, relational skills as the enabler of of good mental health um, and healthy, uh, mentally healthy workplaces. And I like to um, like build on it a bit further in that when we, with the project, one of the interesting things that came out was when I interviewed managers towards the end of the project, they started saying, um, what I really enjoyed about this project was the focus on um, holistic wellbeing and how our staff are going, but also how do we become an employer of choice? How do I make people want to work in my industry despite the content? And, and what they're engaging, but how do we become an employer of choice was really a really big question. And on the flip side, I had the frontline staff that were saying, I've just been to a morning tea to celebrate um, us meeting our KPIs, um, which is great. They're being celebrated there, there's reward. And they were saying, but why isn't there KPIs for the organisation to protect us? And so we have managers wanting to do that and we have frontline staff wanting to see that happen. Um, so it's there, the, the um, desire is there. And we really found in the pilot sites that worked well, it was when these managers really said, I want to care about my employees, I want to retain them, and I want to attract really, really great employees. But that's really where we saw um, a more effective change and they were able to adapt and um, have that courage to address some of the issues in place. Great. Um, and a great segue to Carmen, because you just mentioned um, KPIs and uh, why don't organisations have KPIs? And one of the questions that has come through is around the metrics and tools. What sort of metrics or tools could an organisation use to measure the effectiveness of psychosocial hazard prevention or mental health initiatives? Is there anything out there that somebody might measure against? With the Vicarious Trauma Project, as I mentioned, we used the um, Vicarious Trauma Organisational Readiness Guide, which I think a link might have been shared in the chat. Um, and this was actually, it was really fascinating and it really helped shift from that idea of symptoms. So a lot of the Vicarious Trauma tools focus on symptoms and the rate of Vicarious Trauma or PTSD in the workforce. But this actually, it looks at the organisation and what's in place in the organisation. Um, and it can be really tailored to your organisation's needs. And I really like the use of it actually as a checklist. A lot of our um, workplaces are quite exhausted by over, over being surveyed and, you know, particularly in the public sector, there are a lot of surveys. And so it can become a bit of a drain, but using it as a checklist and almost um, a, a mechanism to support consultation. So, you know, it's got an, a section on supervision and management and it's got a whole lot of criteria underneath that. And some workplaces, some of our pilot sites use that to drive their consultation and they said you know this is what you know is stat from the survey but they actually went back to staff and said what does this actually mean to you what does good supervision mean to you um, and it guided those conversations but also guided the response that pilot sites put in place um i, I think there's probably, I noticed in the chat, there's lots of tools that people have, have talked about. So I think what I want to emphasise is um, a bit of a trap that we can often fall into, which is over assessing without action, without intervention. And I think the risk that that creates is that you're creating a, a culture where staff are constantly being asked, for instance, about things, uh, say in a, in a pulse survey or, or in a census, um, but no action is taken. So there is a need for that continuous improvement and, and ongoing assessment. But if assessment occurs without 
intervention, it introduces that new hazard of staff not feeling that their um, views are being heard or acknowledged or, or um, and so on. So I think um, looking at those tools that are available. I think the second thing I would think about is what Carmen has just spoke about is, so how are we going to talk to staff? How do we make sense of the data we have? Um, often what we may or may not do at an organisational level is we use a whole of organisation assessment tool, but that might actually miss out on some nuances, some particular risks in particular teams or branches. So we can't just stay up at that org level. It's a good place to start, but then we also need to go to the specific teams and orgs. And there is a real risk, and we do find this sometimes, that um, agencies are uh, delivering beautiful interventions at that whole of agency approach, but there's a team here dealing with a particular risk, and that is not captured at that whole of org approach. So um, just be mindful of, of, I guess, the limits of, of assessment um, and, and uh, the risk that gets introduced through assessment, particularly if it's not followed up with with um, with action. Um, and if action isn't taken, again, it comes back to that communication piece. The reason why action wasn't taken is because we have to prioritise this element. Um, so being clear about why decisions have been made as well. Yeah, I absolutely agree with all of those comments. Um, I think um, one way to think about it is in terms of for senior leaders, um, what information do they need and what do they need to do about that information to meet their due diligence obligations under the Work Health and Safety Act? So there's, it's not just about identifying what the issues are and staying abreast of those issues. It, of course, includes that. Um, due diligence includes that as a key element. Under the Work Health and Safety regime, it also means um, um, ensuring that there's appropriate resources to um, respond to the issues that um, uh, senior leaders are, are made aware of or officers of an organisation are made aware of. So I, I completely agree with um, Connie's point about taking action um, and making sure it's visible. And if action can't be taken um, uh, immediately, then it, uh, giving an explanation to workers as to, um, as to why that is. Um, I just did want to point out, and there's been a few comments about it this morning already, but the People at Work um, tool is um, available. It's free. Um, I'd highly recommend it. Um, and it includes, it, it, it does include, a, obviously, an assessment part, a survey, which can be administered across an organisation, but it, it includes a number of tools and, and action plans that can actually manage the outcomes of, um, of the survey. So it's very much a holistic management device as opposed to just an assessment tool. Um, and the other resource I just wanted to point to is the um, the uh, measuring and reporting work health and safety information um, resource, which is available through the Safe Work Australia website. Um, and that includes um, um, leading and lagging indicators, the sorts of things that um, health and safety teams and, and leaders um, might want to consider when they're designing metrics um, to report up to, um, to to senior leaders and to people with responsibilities for work health and safety um, to give them a clear picture of um, what's occurring within a workplace um, and where the particular issues are, um, including um, in relation to psychosocial hazards. Thanks, Luca. Uh, so um, we've had a lot of positive comments about um, your um, pet Cameos too, uh, cats, <laughs> dogs in the workplace. Um, but yes, yeah, some really positive and supportive comments uh, all reflecting what you've uh, just said there, um, uh, Connie, Carmen and Luca, and particularly around translating uh, those polls and uh, those sorts of things into action and the importance of communication of those sorts of things. So we're almost out of time, so we'll end questions there, but just want to give you an opportunity for any concluding comments that you'd like to make. So we might just do a quick um, whip around the um, panel. So any sort of final words you'd love to uh, leave us with? First in, best rest. Um, I'll go. Um, this will sound very obvious, but I do think sometimes, as I've said before, we need to start at, at the basics. Don't forget the people 
within this work. Um, so sometimes we can inadvertently do things to people as opposed to working with people. So um, just keep that focus in mind and, and I'm sure many of you already are. Um, I'll build on that, Connie, and um, yeah, just that, that idea of consulting with staff and really empowering staff so they're heard, they've got a say, and that um, the service and the job is designed around them because they're the actual people delivering the work. Um, they know what's happening and we can have all the policies in place, but unless we actually work with the people that those policies apply to, they're not going to work. So, yeah, thank you. I'm just having trouble getting myself off mute, but I think that that worked. Um, Andrew, I think my concluding comment would just be um, that psychosocial hazards and, and psychosocial risk management is probably a generational challenge, you know, for work health and safety professionals. Um, and and it's when we look back in time, I think we'll probably reconsider how it was ever appropriate to expose people to the sorts of harm that happened before, you know, before the present day. So I think we're definitely in a transition phase where the kind of lines being drawn on what is and what isn't um, acceptable. Um, and of course that that there can sometimes be a lot there can sometimes be challenge in, in going through that transition and and um, it's quite normal to feel um, a range of different emotions <laughs> towards that challenge. Um, but um, and I think this is a point that, that both Connie and Carmen made earlier. It's about continuous improvement. You know, it's about making sure that we're constantly looking for, for changes we can make to, to have a positive benefit and to make sure that we're lifting up the, the safety of the, the workplaces that, um, that we work in. Thanks, Luca. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks, Connie. We really appreciate it. Um, so in wrapping up, uh, I'd like to thank all of our presenters today for joining us. We really appreciate uh, the time, the energy and the effort that you've put into um, being here. But most of all, I'd like to thank uh, the audience for being here. We've got still over 500 people who are uh, online, uh, tuned in and actively engaged. So um, thank you for being here with us uh, for World Mental Health Day. Uh, so we really hope the forums provided you with some insights and key takeaways. And thank you for um, responding to the polls. We can see that is coming through. Uh, so throughout the session, we've posted a number of links to some useful resources that we spoke about. Uh, we've also got a range of uh, free training, and you can find them all on our ComCare's website, uh, which we encourage you to visit. Our next webinar that's part of Safe Work Month is our biannually held Transport Network Forum, and that's on the 17th of October. Uh, and if you thought you weren't interested in it because it was the transport forum, there are so many translatable concepts and ideas that um, it, I have always found it uh, incredibly valuable and useful. And I can um, assure you that some of you will find the same. And on the 26th of October, we're going to have our final webinar for Safe Work Month, which will be around body stressing, musculoskeletal disorders and good work design. And it's going to be a great session. You'll be able to register for that through the link in the chat. Uh, finally, the feedback. Uh, your feedback is really important to us. It shapes the way that we deliver these events and it provides input into the themes, the topics and the questions that we respond to. A short evaluation survey is going to be sent to all of the attendees uh, straight after the event. And there's also a QR code which should be uh, up there on the screen now or coming up any second now. Uh, so you can click on that and you'll be able to um, access it. Uh, so we really encourage you to um, answer now before logging out of the event. Uh, just one or more reminder to stay in touch uh, with ComCare. Uh, every, anything what we're doing, you'll be able to find events, guidance and resources if you subscribe to ComCare's eNews. Or you can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, the links are in the chat section now. And finally, if you're a HSR or a deputy HSR in ComCare's jurisdiction, thanks for joining us. And you can join ComCare's HSR network to receive the latest HSR news, event updates and information. So thanks again for joining us. Have a great day. Stay safe. Take care.